for this CEU webinar today, updates to the UN car seat regulations, a guide for North American car seat techs. So during this webinar, CPSTs will learn what makes a European car seat different from a car seat sold in the United States and discuss current updates and changes to the UN child restraint regulations. Today, our lovely speaker is Sarah Hatterstick. She's a child passenger safety technician instructor and the safety advocacy manager with Good Baby International. I am Laura Dunn, and I'm the NHTSA headquarters representative on the National Child Passenger Safety Board. We do have planned time to answer questions at the end of the presentations, so please enter any questions that you'd like into the Q&A box. Thank you. Or the chat. A few reminders before we get started. Um, attendees are requested to not participate in this webinar if you're operating a motor vehicle. Um, it will be recorded. You can listen to the recording when you safely arrive at your destination. Oh, pardon me. The recording will be posted on carseateducation.org within one to two business days. And for the CPSTs in attendance, the presentation qualifies for one CEU. Attendance on this webinar is required for at least 45 minutes for the CEU credit. So proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. So please welcome me in welcoming, to join me in welcoming Sarah this morning, this afternoon. Thank you, Laura. Um, I just want to say hi real fast on camera, but then I'm actually teaching the STAT course this week uh, at a fire department. So I'm going to turn off my camera because I feel like this glaring business behind me is a lot to look at. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here today. And I'll go ahead and share. All right. Uh, so as Laura mentioned, we are here today to talk about UN car seat regulations and some updates that have been made. And um, specifically, what about this, I think, is useful for you to know as a car seat technician in North America. So today, we will review the key updates that have been made to R44 and R129, the two UN car seat regulations. We'll also talk, you know, in general about the impact of vehicle regulations on the use of child restraints. We will talk about the impact of UN car seats on um, the counterfeit car seat conversation. And then I like to wrap up when we do CEUs like this. It's a lot of information. So I like to kind of close it out with some curbside messaging. What I think are some of the key takeaways that you should be thinking about um, as you work and and work with families out in the field. So I gave, I've been talking international car seats for a number of years. And the first time I think I gave a presentation on this topic was about five years ago or so at a Kids in Motion in Orlando, where we were basically right next to Disney World. So sort of threw this in tongue in cheek, but I think the message is still really relevant and that it really is a small world after all. And the ability of consumers to, you know, purchase things online means there's more and more ability for consumers to inadvertently purchase things that aren't appropriate for use in the United States. So in terms of why I think it's relevant for U.S.-based technicians to understand what's happening in the U.N. and other international car seat regulations is just to give yourself kind of an idea of globally what is happening in the world of child passenger safety, because more and more you may see some of these products um, with the easy prevalence of online shopping and shipping, et cetera. So to start, you know, I want to start with just a few kind of universal truths. We know from data with the World Health Organization that motor vehicle crashes are the leading cause of death for children and adults ages 5 through 29 years old. And we know that the use of child restraints can provide up to a 60% reduction in fatalities. So we know that car seats are really important and can do a really important job in a crash. Additionally, the UN has set global road safety performance targets, and one of those targets is directly related to child passenger safety, and says that by 2030, we will increase the proportion of motor vehicle occupants using safety belts or standard child restraint systems to close to 100%. Now, do I think that in the next six years, we will get to 100% usage? 
I don't really know. But at the end of the day, in order to make big, bold reductions, you have to set really big, bold goals. And that's the target in that UN Global Road Safety Performance. We also know that regulatory standards protect children. There's a number of standards out there globally that will today, again, we're going to focus mostly on that UN regulation, but there's a number of standards and their whole purpose is to set a performance standard so that any car seat that is out in the world um, can meet a minimum level of performance so that we can protect kids in crashes. That's the whole goal of these regulatory standards. But at the end of the day, we've also seen a lot of news articles. Do we really have an influx of counterfeit products? There's a lot. I mean, all of these articles that I looked at were just from last summer. So there's a lot of discussion about this going on. How do we spot a fake or counterfeit car seat? Beware of dangerous counterfeit car seats. And hospitals warning about rises in counterfeit car seats coming through. So I'm posing this question now. We're going to come back to it a little bit later. But do we really have this influx of dangerous counterfeit products? We'll keep chatting. But I want to start us with, you know, a little bit background on these regulations. So starting here with this map, um, this shows some international standards. This does not show all of the regulatory standards that exist. Uh, again, today we are focusing on the UN based standards. So those are um, highlighted here in the dark and the light green colors. So to kind of give you an idea of the scope of how many countries uh, have used products that are under these UN regulations regulatory standards. You can see it's a big chunk of the global population. Uh, there are some individual countries that have their own standards, you know, primarily in the U.S. We have the FMVSS in Canada. They have their own CMVSS. Uh, Australia, New Zealand has their own standards, and there's a handful of others. Many of the others are, you know, built around parts of the U.N regulations and then add in something specific to their individual country. China has their own CCC, Chinese Compulsory Certification. So there's some other things that are out there too. Again, our discussion today focuses on what's happening under the UN standard, which is what you see in those green colors. So the UN regulation works by way of a type approval process. And I think it's worth a couple minutes to talk through this because it is a little bit different than what we do in the United States or in Canada under our motor vehicle safety standards. So remember back from certification class, and I know there's always brand new technicians and very seasoned technicians on these calls, but humor me for a minute and remember back to your certification course where we talked about self-certification and that manufacturers in the United States States are responsible for self-certifying our product to the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. So NHTSA is not out there testing all of our car seats and telling us that our car seat is okay to use before we start to sell it. It's our responsibility as a manufacturer to meet all of those standards that are all of those regulatory components that are set forth in the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard uh, before we start to sell that product. It's a little bit different under the UN regulation. So this type approval process means that that manufacturer of a car seat has to have a type approval certificate in order to produce and sell this product. That certificate is granted by a type approval authority. So essentially like a government body. Testing under this program is outsourced to labs that are called technical services. If a manufacturer, like in this case, Cybex, who is one of my brands, we have um, a, our main offices are based in Germany and we do have our own crash test facility. So if Cybex wanted, we can perform our own testing at our facility. However, it has to be overseen still by that technical service. So it's not like the U.S. system where we can do this on our own to self-certify. And this whole system works by a process called mutual recognition, which means if I am Cybex and I manufacture my product and I get my type approval from Germany, which is one of the type approval authorities, but I want to sell my product in the UK, the UK type approval has to accept 
my type approval from Germany. It all works together that if I'm a type approval and I've been recognized as a type, a type approval authority by the UN, then any type approval authority has to accept that product and, and allow the sale of that product. Once you get your type approval uh, and you've started selling your product, after a certain number of sales, uh, the type approval authority will do what's called a conformity of production test. So they will pull some of those samples. They will do that testing again to ensure that your car seat is still conforming to the approved type approval um, as it did before you started selling the product. So it looks just a little bit different than what we do in the United States. Now, I mentioned from the beginning, there's two car seat regulations in the UN system, R44 and R129. R44 is the older, it's a lower number. It was an earlier regulation. So this was the first car seat regulation and R129 has been introduced more recently. So to start, just to give you a few of kind of the defining characteristics, I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time digging into each of these standards because I want you to more understand what's changing and what things will look like moving forward. So R44, the older standard was defined by weight. So if I was gonna go buy a product, I would look at that label and it would have a weight range that would be appropriate for the child to use that product. They also used a frontal crash test, which is, you know, what we do today in 213. They also had a rear impact crash test for rear facing car seats. They used a series of ATDs called the P series of dummies, which had, you know, limited capabilities, but could give measurements on head excursion, chest deflection, et cetera. And in terms of, you know, encouraging rear facing use, forward facing with these products was allowed at nine kilograms, which is just under 20 pounds. They didn't in the regulation have a specific age limit. So most car seats indicated you could start forward facing somewhere between nine or 12 months old. So then R129 started to be introduced. Um, and R129, the goal here was to be an improvement. This was something new. This was going to update that car seat regulation. So they made a few key changes. And one of those, which I just think is kind of interesting, is that car seats under R129 are defined by the child's height or that stature measurement, which you know I think sounds odd to me. And even as a mom, I could tell you exactly what my five-year-old weighs right now. But if you ask me how tall he is, I'm probably gonna take a sort of guess because I really have no idea how tall he is. If I don't take out a measurement stick and actually measure him. But in the UN area and in many of these countries, they actually do like children's clothing sizes are defined by that child's stature or their height. So it actually is a measurement that is a little bit more familiar to many families um, in countries that would be utilizing these car seats. So they made that change again to make this easier for consumers to understand what to do. Uh, they also updated their crash testing. So still doing a frontal crash test, uh, it, but they updated that test design and the sled to be a little bit more representative of a modern day vehicle. They've added in a side impact crash test and they do still that rear impact crash for rear facing car seats. So this should sound a little bit familiar with what is happening right now in the US in the world of child passenger safety in that we now are updating our frontal crash test and we have introduced a side impact regulation. So all of these things will be changing as well in the United States in the next couple of years, but that was part of what they were bringing in under this updated regulation 129. They also updated the dummies that they were using to what's called the Q series dummies. And these provide additional biofidelity and options for other test metrics. So they're looking at head, neck, chest, and abdomen metrics through testing. And then finally, they really wanted to think about how do we encourage consumers to keep children rear facing a little bit longer. As noted, we're using height measurements here. So they started with a minimum allowance of 76 centimeters for forward facing use that comes in just under 30 inches. They also now mandate an age minimum of 15 months. Um, so at a minimum, the child has to be at least 15 months old before they can turn forward facing. So all of that was part of this new regulatory standard. So from here on out, I really wanna focus a little bit more on 
what is in this updated regulation. There's a few pieces. So first, it didn't all come in at once. It wasn't like, here's a big dump of all of this new information to try to process as either a consumer or a manufacturer. Everything came in in phases. And the big focus was on ease of use for the consumer. And what they determined is that Isofix, or their version of Latch, um, is really the easiest for the consumer to understand how to use. And specifically, Isofix is, you know, classified as not only lower anchor use, but rigid lower anchor attachment with that car seat. So that really when you attach that car seat to the to the anchor bars in the vehicle, there's not much else you need to do to get that nice tight installation. So pretty straightforward. So they first came in with eye size or universal isofix attachment. And actually, before I say that, I'll say the category of car seats we're looking right at right now are called integral car seats, which means that the restraint of the child is integral to the car seat system. We would think of this as a harnessed car seat. That harness is what's holding the child in the car seat. It's integral to the car seat. You can also, underneath the UN regulation, use a shield system as the harness. All of those count as an integral child restraint. So the first thing in the integral category was this eye size or universal isofix. And eye size was really created again to focus on that ease of use. Hey, this is Laura. We are checking with Sarah um, about whether she still has connectivity. Um, there's a, some storms happening where she is, so hold on for just a moment and we'll be right back. Can you hear me again now? Yes, we can. So sorry about that. This is what you get for, you know, giving presentations when you're not at your home office. Uh, let me go back then and share my slides, which have now disappeared. There they are. All right. So I'm not really sure where this left off, but just, I'll just say yeah. again. <laughs> Integral car seats means that that harness is or the restraint of the child is integral to that where with harnessed car seats uh, and really focused on eye size because rigid isofix that rigid lower anchor from the car seat to the vehicle they determined to be the easiest thing for a consumer to that nice tight installation and that is the goal here and they really wanted to minimize misuse you know we all talk about that they wanted to minimize minimize that misuse out in the field so they went towards this type of attachment method and that was what they really wanted to push moving forward eye size specifically means that eye size car seat if it's identified as an eye size car seat it means the car seat fits within a specific envelope and that size envelope also fits within an eye size seating position in a vehicle so there's a separate eye size regulation 
on the vehicle manufacturer size as well. And these two things then work together. So if I were to buy an I-size car seat, I am guaranteed for that car seat to fit in my I-size seating position in my I-size vehicle. So it helps the consumer understand compatibility and what they can do and what's going to work for their situation. The next thing that additionally came in there was something they call specific vehicle isofix. And anytime you see specific vehicle, it means that the car seat manufacturer can choose to make a car seat that is actually a little bit bigger or differently shaped than the actual space and size envelope that is available. But in that case, it's on the manufacturer to the car seat manufacturer to specifically tell the consumer exactly which vehicles that car seat can be positioned in. As you can imagine, that's a good bit of work for that car seat manufacturer. Uh, so, but it, that category exists and that's available if the car seat manufacturer wants to do something outside of those size parameters of an actual eye size isofix um, seating system. The next thing that came in is something called universal belted. Belted means attached with a vehicle seatbelt. Universal meaning generally compatible in most seating positions. So again, fitting within a specific size envelope. So the first thing that I want you to notice here is that an I-size car seat is not going to give you a seatbelt attachment option. It's a little different than the way that we are required to create a car seat in the United States. Similarly, then for number four, you can see that that again, the car seat manufacturer can give you a belted attached option with a specific vehicle if they want to make it bigger or do something a little different, but then they have to list for you, the consumer, all of the different vehicles that could work in that situation. So in terms of big differences from what we do in the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard in the United States, our FMVSS 213 requires that our car seat give you two options for how you're going to install it, both a latch option and a belt option. So we have to give the consumer that option to use what is going to work best and to give them the opportunity to choose what will work best in their consider or in their vehicle. But under the UN regulation 129, you are expressly prohibited from doing that. So you cannot have both seatbelt and isofix installation on that one single car seat. You're either going to have one or the other because they deemed that to be better from an ease of use and misuse perspective. The other difference that you heard me say a few times is that there is a size envelope. And in this case, we call this the ISO envelope. So it's a size within which the car seat needs to fit. And additionally, it's an envelope that has to be able to fit on the vehicle side as well. And you can kind of see that gray shaded kind of angular shape around that car seat is the envelope that we're talking about. And you can see that that envelope also does include that load leg as an anti-rotation device as well. So then as they were phasing in car seats, they got to the booster seats or non-integral child restraint systems. Non-integral meaning the restraint of the child is not integral to that booster seat because what's holding a child in in a booster seat but a vehicle seatbelt. The booster seat is not what is restraining the child during a crash event. So this is the non-integral category. They started again with this eye size booster idea so eye size boosters have rigid isofix attachments, but they have to be stowable. So they don't have to be used. You have to be able to stow them uh, and or you can do specific vehicles. So again, if you don't want to fit inside the size envelope, you can do something a little bit bigger outside of that scope of the envelope. But you have to then list which vehicles we're compatible with. And then they moved on to the booster cushion. This was the last thing that got phased in with the R129. Uh, booster cushion is what they would call our backless booster. That's typically what we think of it, or a no-back booster in the United States. Uh, universal, again, meaning can fit in most vehicles, fits in this size envelope. Um, also may have isofix if they choose, but does not have to have isofix attachments. And then again, specific vehicle if they go somewhere outside of that size envelope. So again, differences here from FMVSS. 
we have an envelope. In FMVSS, we really don't have these size envelopes that we work with. So here again, the volume is different. So the size of the envelope looks a little bit different from the integral or harnessed car seats to the booster seats, but there still is that specific envelope that they're working with. And I thought really interestingly, booster cushions or that backless booster is restricted to kids who are over 125 centimeters or which is 49 inches tall. And the idea here is they want these shorter kids as they are starting to use the booster seats to start in that high back configuration and ideally then want these kids in booster cushions or backless boosters to have heads that are positioned so that their head will be will benefit from the side airbags so they want to restrict those smaller kids to using the high back booster where they're then in a side impact crash in particular they're still going to get some benefit from the side structure of the booster seat and they want the the taller kids if they're using the booster cushion they want to make sure that that booster cushion is going to lift them to the point that their head is going to have the protection from the side airbag in the vehicle so at the end of the day i hope that you can kind of see the car seat regulation is definitely very related to the vehicle regulations so in this case these un regulated child restraints are really relevant to these UN regulated vehicles and the vehicle components that are regulated. And it misaligned legislation, so allowing you know a mix of UN car seats and other types of vehicles can lead to compatibility issues and potential for misuse. Our vehicles in the United States are different than UN regulated vehicles. They have different regulations, they do different things and different compatibilities, just like our car seats look and feel a little bit different. So again, to give you kind of some background for where we're going and what is happening today. R44, that original car seat regulation, was introduced in 1981, which is roughly around the time that the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 213 was also introduced. So way back in the 80s, we started working on all of these car seat issues. July of 2013, so just over 10 years ago, is when R129 began to phase in. And we talked about that, started with the ISOFIX and the I size and started phasing in with these harnessed car seats. And it came in waves periodically. By 2017, R44, again, that older regulation, could no longer have new type approvals. So what that means is if I'm, you know, Cydex, I'm a car seat manufacturer and I'm manufacturing some car seats um, and I have some R44 type approvals. I've got the approval to manufacture, we'll say this infant car seat. Uh, up to that point, there is no expiration on my type approval. So if I got this car seat that was, uh, I got a new type approval in 2016, I can produce that infant car seat for forever. You know, I've got this type approval. It is approved. I can do this. Uh, in 2017, if I wanted to come out with a brand new infant car seat, I could no longer get a new type approval under R44. I would have to then use the newer R129 regulation to get that brand new car seat to market. Then in 2020, R44 would no longer allow extensions to existing type approvals, which means if I go back to my example, if I have a type approval from 2016 with an infant car seat, but I want to update the fashion of the infant car seat. I've been selling like a blue and white polka dot, and now I want to sell a blue and red polka dot option. I could potentially go to the type approval authority and say, hey, you already gave me this type approval and this is, you know, the characteristics of this seat, including this blue and white polka dot fashion. But I want to use the same materials and just move this fashion to blue and red. They could grant me an extension and then I'd be able to, under the existing type approval, still sell that same car seat, but now with this new fashion. Had I wanted to do something more complex, changed anything really about the hard goods and or even used different material in terms of the fashion, I probably wouldn't have gotten the extension to start with. But in this case, in 2020, I can no longer even do that. So if I started selling this infant car seat and I wanted to in 2021 change my pattern and have a new blue and purple polka dot, 
I couldn't do that anymore. So now you get what you get, whatever you were selling at that time, those are the seats that you have available that still have those R44 type approvals. So I can't get new ones and I can't get extensions on existing. And at that point, R129 is fully phased in. Everything we talked about from harness seats all the way to backless boosters, all of those car seats exist in the world and that regulation has been fully phased in. So then in 2023, things start to get a little bit more complicated. So the way the UN regulatory process works, I said we had that mutual recognition process where any type approval authority is obliged to accept any other type approval authority. Well, the way it works to kind of phase out an old regulation, there was a time in 2023, September 1st of 2023, where under R44, you were no longer obligated to accept a type approval which means that if I'm Germany and I've approved, you know, I'm a, a car seat manufacturer, I got a type approval from Germany and it's an R44 car seat, the people in the UK no longer have to accept my R44 car seat. They could decide they don't want to sell these anymore because they are older. So then what happens more recently is that September 1st of this year, R44 car seats will no longer be sold in the EU. Now, I want to be clear here, the EU is not all of the UN countries. It's not all of the places that could have or would accept an R44 type approval. The EU has a totally separate piece of legislation that basically says they are obligated only to accept the latest regulation when there's an option to phase out a previous regulation. So in this case, because under R44, they were trying to kind of sunset this and you no longer had to accept that type approval, this new other EU legislation kicks in and says, all right, so in the EU, we can no longer accept this. That's the way that our legislative system and regulatory system is going to work. This really has nothing to do with car seats. This is in, in effect for any type of regulation. It's an EU piece of legislation specific to the EU. What this also means is that any other country can still take and accept these R44 car seats. You still can't get new type approvals and you still can't get extensions. But whatever existing R44 product is out there, other countries can still sell. So you've got the UK will still accept R44 products, Japan out there still accepting R44 products. So many, many countries will still allow for the use of, and the sale of these types of products. Uh, really kind of nitty gritty, a little bit more description of this. I said September 1st was the date that you no longer had to do this. In the EU, they were able to get an extension because, you know, they really didn't want a very wasteful like bonfire of existing car seats that could no longer be sold. So they came to a compromise agreement where any car seat that was available for sale on September 1st of last year has a whole additional year. So that's where we get to September 1st of this year, 2024, to be sold. So you can't, if you didn't have it in the market yet on September 1st of 2023, you can't sell it. But if it was already on the market, it gives the opportunity for retailers and manufacturers to sell out of that existing inventory so that there isn't just a big wasteful dump of car seats um, at the end of the day, because nobody wants that. So what does this mean for us? What is this, all of that description of what's happening over in Europe and in all these other countries around the globe? Why is that relevant to us as car seat technicians? So I want to come back to my counterfeit car seat conversation because I think this is where this information is really relevant for us as technicians in the U.S. Uh, so I'm going to take us down a little story here. And this car seat in particular, uh, I live in Florida for those that, that don't know me. And I was teaching locally in Florida with uh, some folks in our just regular local uh, car seat teaching team. And one of the instructors said, hey, we just pulled this counterfeit car seat from, you know, a family at the hospital. I'll bring it to class. Let me show you. So they show up with this car seat. And, you know, this is just a couple pictures of what we were looking at here when they brought it to class. And I said, OK, so what about this makes you think that this product is counterfeit? 
And the first response was, well, look, it, it's just got this really cheap looking three point harness. This can't possibly be safe. This doesn't look like anything that, you know, we would typically see in the United States. And I said, all right, well, if I look at the R44 regulation, specifically a Y-shaped belt is what we're looking at here, what we would think of as that three-point harness. And it means a harness where you've got a combination of straps between the child's leg and a strap for each shoulder. It makes the letter Y that you see there. And it specifically notes in their regulation that this can be used in rearward facing and lateral facing child restraint systems or you know something we don't have in the US, they would call it a carry cot. That is what's allowed here. So, so far, I see something that is 100% allowable in this regulatory system. So then she said, but this webbing, it's really thin. This just doesn't look like it's robust. It doesn't look safe. It's really just doesn't look like what I would see on an infant car seat. So again, going to this regulation, the minimum width of the webbing, the child restraint straps that contact the dummy or the child, needs to be 25 millimeters for the smaller car seats. And then when that sentence continues, it's 38 millimeters for groups two and three would be a forward facing kind of kids. 25 millimeters for those that don't know like millimeters to inches right off the top of your head, that's just shy of an inch. Under the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, all of our car seats, any harness webbing that it, that touches that child has to be at least an inch and a half wide. So yes, this looks quite different than what we would see on a car seat in the United States because our regulation says we have to be at least an inch and a half wide. But it isn't unsafe under this regulation because it's doing exactly what this regulation says, which is just about an inch wide. That's what's required here for this type of car seat. By the by, 38 millimeters is also an inch and a half. So the forward facing car seats have that same inch and a half that we would see on our products in the United States. And then it's, well, but it doesn't have a chest clip. This just looks different than what we would picture on any of our car seats in the United States. But again, under R44, uh, they have a specific requirement that says you have to be able to release the child from the child restraint by a single operation on a single buckle. And specifically says that a connection between the shoulder straps of the harness is deemed not to comply. So they are expressly prohibited from adding that chest clip. So again, this car seat that I'm looking at is doing all of the things that the regulation says it has to be doing. So then she said, but look at these labels. The labels don't look right. They are missing information. I don't see all of the words I expect to see on our car seats. So under R44, this label that I see right here, the airbag label looks exactly like the airbag label that is required. And yes, it looks quite different than the airbag label that we use in the United States. Because if you go back to that picture that I showed at the very beginning of the big map and all of those green countries that accept these R44 or R129 products, that's a lot of different countries that speak a lot of different languages and labels do not have a lot of real estate to work with. So there's just no way that you would be able to put all of the words on the label for all of those different countries and languages that could be spoken. So instead, the UN standard uses a lot of pictures, pictures to get you the basic idea and then that little finger point going to the book saying, hey, go look at your instructions, which is where they translate a lot of those languages for you. So this again is exactly what I would expect to see. But however, it is different than what we would see under the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. And then finally, as we were looking over this product, I spotted this label. And right away, this label shows me that this is an R44 compliant product. So what does this label right here mean? And just as background, often this label is orange, but I learned last year that it is not in the regulation that this label has to be orange. I have seen them now in red and in green, so it can really be any color. Often you will find it in orange. So at the top of this label, we get the regulation and the series of amendments. So in this case, you see clearly this says R44. So this is a type approval for R44. 
The next line tells you what the category is, and we didn't go through all of the categories for R44, but this was one of those categories. And I mentioned that R44, the older stand or older regulation was primarily driven by that weight range. So then you can see the weight range on that product. Then really importantly, you can see the type approval authority. So every type approval authority has their own letter and numeric code. And this one is E57. Then also very important, each product has its own type approval number. This is a unique number. So this is an identifying piece of information. And then in this case, we have that car seat product group. So zero plus an infant seat. So that is relative to the size range of children that can be used. So I have heard people say, but Sarah, there are fake regulatory labels out there. Okay. If you really want to dig a little bit deeper, you can absolutely do that because there is specific information on this label. So I mentioned E57 is the type approval authority. So if I want to try to verify this product to determine if this really is a real product that has really actually been type approved to this standard, I can go to the UN website and I can look up that type approval authority. Now, I promised Kendra I would send a PDF of these slides, so please don't worry about trying to write down this website you'll get a copy of the slides if i go to this document from the un and scroll down to regulation 44 at the top of the screen i can see the full list of all the type approval numbers that ece symbol right there so if i scan all the way down i can get to 57 which shows me that the type approval authority is san marino so then you can see some additional information, including their technical services. So if I go back into that UN document and scan a little bit further in, I can find the technical service contact information. So in San Marino, there are three different technical services and it lists specific contact information, including in most cases, an email address for a specific person um, at that type of or that technical service. So I could go back to that label, I could get that type approval number, I could contact this technical service and ask them to indeed confirm if they did, you know, give this type approval to this specific product. But at the end of the day, when this family shows up at your hospital trying to discharge home with their baby, is it necessary to do all of that work? My answer to you would be no you really don't need to chase down all of that information. All you need to do is explain to the family that this product is not approved for use in the United States. It seems that the product is compliant to an international car seat standard. At that point, I would be explaining to the family, here's how you can hopefully find a product in the US that is compliant, a reputable retailer, going to the AAP um, healthychildren.org car seat buying guide, any way that you can help that family find a product that is appropriate to use in the United States. But in this case, you can't use a car seat that is not compliant to the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, and this one is not. Transport Canada in June of 2023 issued a series of recalls uh, related to products that were for sale in Canada. Uh, I believe all sold via Timu, which was, you know, gaining in popularity at that point. All of them look to me like just looking and not seeing anything specific, but they all kind of look like products that could be sold under, you know, potentially R44 or a UN regulatory standard. And Transport Canada issued notices and recalls about all of these because they do not display the national safety mark, which you see on the screen, this maple leaf label, which is required to be on any of the products sold in Canada. That's part of their regulation and it's a requirement. So it's fairly easy for Transport Canada to say, look, these products don't have this, therefore they do not meet our regulation. So it's not necessarily that they are making a statement about the safety of the product in this situation. They're just stating the facts that this does not meet our regulatory requirements. But I often see in some of this discussion, some discussion about this, you know, idea of this fake Chinese car seat. 
that these counterfeit seeds, there's so many of them, you know, this is an article, the manufacturer was listed as unknown, but it was traced to China. Why Chinese goods from Amazon are dangerous. This is an investigation by CNN. Comments on some of these articles. I wouldn't trust an imitation car seat. No testing or regulations at all. Do you trust Chinese factories? This idea being that because of the country of origin, we can infer something about potentially the quality of that product. Now, hear me out. <laughs> I know that there are indeed fake car seats out there. There are counterfeit products. And Duna, unfortunately for them, is one that does experience a number of knockoffs of the design of their product. And they have a statement out about this. There have been videos that show some crash testing with this. So certainly there are some issues here. My point being, many of the products that we do end up seeing often come with regulatory compliance labels that would indicate that this product is not actually fake or counterfeit or dangerous, but maybe just compliant to a different regulatory standard. So I wanted to take a minute and I went through the AAP car seat buying guide because I wanted to kind of take on that idea of country of origin. There's something like about just under 300 car seats on the 2023 car seat buying guide list. So I looked at each of those and determined just the country of origin. So this is nothing to do with market share. This is just of all the models of car seats that were available in 2023, where did they come from? And what you will find is that there's a small amount of car seats that are actually manufactured in Europe very small. There's a, a nice chunk of the pie where there's manufacturers in the United States or in Canada, so people manufacturing product in North America. But that whole chunk of blue, the majority of car seats that are available on the market today, completely legitimate FMVSS 213 compliant car seats are manufactured in China. There's a couple of our engineers right now in China working hand in hand with our partners in the factories and in the design labs in China. Every day we are in communication with our teams in China who are doing this kind of work too. So I asked our teams if they could share any export information. You know, what are we talking about when we talk about the scope of manufacturing in China? So just to orient you to what we're looking at here, the yellow bars are export volume in billions of US dollars. The line that you see across the chart is the production of child restraint systems in the millions of units. So if we just look at 2022, China exported nearly $1 billion of car seats and produced 19.7 million car seats. That is an awful lot of work. It is a lot of the child restraints that we check and we see and we use every single day. So I say all of that to say and to just end with, we as car seat technicians are the subject matter experts and the professionals in this field. And the language that we use when we share information like this with families and with the media, it's really important. And I think when we start to say things like counterfeit or fake, there's an implication that that product is dangerous, it's scary, it makes families worried and feel bad about the decisions that they've made for their family. So I think it's really important that we think through neutral and factual language and we stick to what we know. And as technicians, we know and understand Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 213. We understand what we learn in certification class about how that car seat should look and what labels it should have with it. We understand 
more than the average consumer about which brands are available in the United States, what models are available in the United States. When that car seat shows up to you, whether that's curbside or at your hospital and the webbing looks a little weird and it doesn't have the five point harness or it doesn't have a chest clip and something just looks off. But if you scan that product and you find that label that I shared with you that has some UN regulatory information on it, I cannot make a judgment about whether that product is actually fake or counterfeit. I can only tell you that that product is not compliant with Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 213 and therefore not legal to use in the United States. And that's a big difference from fake or counterfeit. It's just compliant or it's not compliant. So to wrap things up, and I think even with my crazy internet drama, <laughs> I think we still have a few minutes for questions, but I just wanted to again share what I think are the most important takeaways from this in that it's not uncommon to find UN regulated products making their way to the United States. They're not supposed to, they shouldn't be sold in the United States, but the prevalence of online shopping kind of makes this like the wild west. Things can be available and things can slip in and come in and it is not, out of the realm of possibility that somebody could inadvertently purchase this thing because they saw this stroller that they really liked and it came with this car seat. So bonus, I love it. That happens. It is really important that we stick to the factual language when we're talking about if this product is available for use and, uh, and appropriate to use in the United States. So it's not compliant or it is compliant or it's legal or it's not legal to use. It is also very, very important that we are always leading with empathy and understanding and we're not scaring or shaming families. Often they're just shopping online. They saw something cool on Amazon that they really thought this stroller was amazing and look at it comes with this cool car seat and we're all set and we're so excited for this baby. So when then they find out, you know, as they're trying to take this baby home that this thing that they bought that they thought was so great actually isn't appropriate they didn't know that. They don't know what you know. They just saw this thing that they bought and it showed up at their house. So it's important that we're always thinking and being, you know, empathetic with families. They're just trying to do the best that they can do. And remember your scope as technicians. Again, I know more than the average person about UN regulations and which car seats are appropriate and not appropriate, but I couldn't tell you for certain if this product is indeed compliant under R44. I can just tell you what I see, which is if I see that label, I have to trust that that product is a type that is a true type approval label and that product has met those type approval requirements under those UN regulations. And then always, when in doubt, contact the manufacturer. And that's either if you want to try to track down the manufacturer of that product, or I am always happy to be somebody's phone a friend. I see a lot of these when people, because I present about this topic, when people see something show up, I'm happy to look at that product with you and be a second set of eyes about what this might be that's sitting in front of you. So when in doubt, contact somebody else and you know try to figure out what's going on. So this is my contact information. Big acknowledgements on our team to uh, Dinos, who is our, he's based in the UK. He is absolutely our regulatory expert. He goes to Geneva to all of the UN meetings on our behalf. Uh, so he helped with a lot of this content as well as Phil Prisbolo, who is our VP of Child Safety. So Laura, I think I have a couple minutes if there's any questions. Yes, we sure do. Um, let me... So a couple questions. Uh, the first question that we have is from Partha, and her question was, recently came across a question. Family moved to Europe, took their U.S. car with them. They were wondering if they could install a European seat they purchased in their U.S. car, and if there are any other considerations for installation. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad it sounds like they purchased a car seat when they were in Europe. So it should be something that is regulated to UN because you should always be using a car seat that is relevant to the country in which you live. Um, you know, the vehicle, as I mentioned, like 
vehicle compatibility has a lot to do with that regulatory standard for car seats too. I think, you know, if they have a newer US vehicle and it has those lower anchor attachments, using an ISOVIX car seat with that vehicle should be no issue. Um, and then additionally, using a belt attached car seat, you know, should still also work without an issue. Um, when in doubt, test it out, but it sounds like that shouldn't be too much of a compatibility issue, especially with a newer vehicle from the United States. Uh, the one thing I think I would add to that, though, is that, you know, remember that a lot of products in Europe, so these UN regulated car seats, you saw that that envelope also includes the load leg. And depending on what U.S. vehicle they have, uh, some manufacturers do prohibit the use of the load leg in either certain seating positions or in any of those seating positions. So that part I would, depending on what car seat they're using um, that they did purchase in Europe, if it has a load leg, I would maybe look at that a little bit more closely, too. Thank you. Um, Stephanie had her hand raised and did ask a question. Um, there are unfortunately fakes, which are seats that cannot pass compliance, that are on recall, but cannot be rectified. She agrees with language. Um, most images that we're seeing, uh, non-experts are showing seats that are perhaps not compliant instead of 213 seats. So, um, oh, and Claire has a question here um, about what could CPSC or NHTSA do to help prevent sales of non-compliant seats or put out more awareness? <laughs> that sounds more like a Laura question. <laughs> it sure uh, does. You know, I think people are aware and Laura, I mean, you can certainly speak to this. I think Amazon certainly knows and, um, has requirements of car seat manufacturers that are selling our products via Amazon. So, you know, I don't think people are unaware of this and I don't think there is a lack of trying. I think there's a lot of complicating factors as well. There are, and I will just answer briefly um, on behalf of uh, NHTSA. Um, our uh, enforcement office, as well as our Office of Chief Counsel works um, with some of those online sellers, uh, Walmart, eBay, Amazon, um, to uh, prevent those sales and work with them about, you know, things that they can require that um, may uh, alleviate some of those products being offered or if they are offered, you know, taken, having them taken down. So that is an ongoing effort that happens behind the scenes. But um, I do agree, Claire, um, that we uh, should be working on awareness um, with perhaps parents and caregivers and, and spreading that message. So thank you. Are there any other questions at this point? So we do have a few uh, notes here just before we leave. Um, I want to tell you about our webinar for next time. Our next community education webinar is using countermeasures that work to strengthen your CPS program. Uh, this is a webinar um, that I'm going to be giving um, with a colleague of mine from our Office of Behavioral Safety Research um, about countermeasures that work and how you can use it to um, improve your CPS program. So that's Tuesday, February 20th from 2 to 3 p.m. Please join us, register for that. We'd love to see you. And did you know that you can earn all of your CEUs and community education requirements online at the free Child Passenger Safety Learning Portal? Please check it out if you haven't. It's so cool. CarSeatEducation.org. Uh, or you can scan the QR code on the screen. Any questions about that site at all, you can email training at cpsboard.org. This is something special and it's a secret. So Dr. Marilyn Bull, who we all love, uh, is stepping down from the National CPS Board this May. After 25 years of service, she's the longest serving member of the board. So we would love your help in celebrating her time and accomplishments in child passenger safety. So if you would like to thank her, share photos, um, please go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen. Messages are due by April 30th, 2024. And also, if you know or work with Dr. Bull, please keep this to yourself and don't share it on social media. Um, we're hoping to kind of surprise her at the next in-person board meeting. So please email secretariat at cpsboard.org with any questions related to that. And thank you guys so much for joining us today. This recording is going to be available, um, posted on carseateducation.org in about one to two business days. For the CPS techs in attendance, um, the presentation qualifies for one CEU. 
and that proof of attendance will be emailed 24 hours after the webinar. And then you must enter the webinar info into your profile at cert.safekids.org. And just another reminder for those of you who are showing up as um, unknown user, that means you don't have a name bubble. It just says unknown user for your name. Those are the folks that you need to type your name into the chat so you can get credit for this webinar. So thank you guys so much. Thanks for joining us today. And we hope that you have a great rest of your day. Kendra, you can